My name is Rafael Lozano Hammer. I am the artist at the first ever Mexican Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, for the, this edition of the Biennale, Mexico has rented a 15th century palazzo in Canareggio region. It's called the Palazzo of Soranzo Banaxo. And we have um, about 1,000 square meters of exhibition space and 3,000 square meters in total. And what we decided to do is to make a proposal of exhibition of six interactive installations which take place in the first and second floors of the palace. The first piece that you encounter in the pavilion as you walk into the first floor is called Wave Function. And it basically consists of an array of uh, Eames designed uh, sort of plastic molded chairs on a Sarinen base. base. Um, and these chairs are sort of arranged very similar to what you might find at a conference or a lecture hall. Um, except that what happens is that as you walk in, there's a camera that detects your presence and then um, controls these um, chairs to go up and down about 40 centimeters off the ground, creating a wave that sort of radiates away from your presence over the entire field of chairs. So as more people enter the space, these chairs will react like waves. Um, and you know the, the, the mathematics behind the project is fluid dynamics, which means that you know if there's two people generating waves, these waves will interfere with each other and cancel each other out or, or augment their, their impact. So you get turbulence, you get eddies, you get this kind of complex nonlinear behavior. So it really is a kind of kinetic sculpture, but not where the movements are not pre-programmed. It's not a sequence of animatronics, and it's also not uh, at random. It's a new kind of kinetic sculpture because it is really sort of generated by the flow of people around the exhibition space. And the piece using these kinds of chairs, um, and, in, and in general the idea of the absence of the public and the question of who is the observer and who is the observed and who is passive and who is active and so on is a big part of my work. It's a project that it's um, based a lot on the idea of modularity, right? Um, this chair itself was designed by um, Charles and Ray Eames in the 1950s. And it's, um, it's really the product of, of sort of modernity and being able to mass produce. Um, these chairs are now, even though they're masters of design, they're now, you know, sort of default in airports or bus stations or whatever. And I like very much the idea that this is a collective of chairs that has a fancy. It's kind of like another life of these chairs. Um, and as they are animated, they're actually just uh, expressing themselves in a way that is eccentric, which to me goes against the idea of modularity. So Frequency and Volume is a work from 2003. It's also a piece that works with surveillance, as much of my work does. It's a project where your body becomes an antenna that you can actually cue um, or, or listen to different um, electromagnetic uh, frequencies in the spectrum, uh, such as, for instance, radio and TV. But we also have radio scanners that allow your body to, for instance, listen to the police or to cell phones or to air traffic control or taxi dispatch sequences. If we get more shadows, you get different kinds of Sounds. A lot of my work is based on light and shadow, and light and shadow is very architectural forms. So I'm interested not so much in objects, but more in environments. The idea that um, this stuff surrounds us, or this stuff um, is, you know, kind of made tangible through um, our presence. So it's a very sort of strange project in that it is your body that allows you to materialize or to visualize um, all of this invisible realities that are coexisting with us, which is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, in the project, as you walk from left to right, you can, you're kind of like the radio dial that can pick up the different frequencies. And then as you become bigger or smaller, as your shadow becomes bigger or smaller, the volume of the channel that you are actually tuning can increase or decrease. So at any given time you might have four, or five, six people and they can be all listening to different um, sound channels creating a sound sculpture. So in the project of Frequency and Volume I'm interested in um, and the idea of the radioelectric spectrum as a public space. You know, well, who has access to this public space? Um, and the answer is typically, you know, governments and corporations. So it's a piece about, well, exactly what is the role of the individual when uh, sort of faced with this um, asymmetry of access. 
Most of my work uh, takes place outdoors in large public art projects, usually involving light, shadow, projection, sensors, robots. Um, and for the Mexican Pavilion, what we decided to do is something much more intimate. Even though the projects are big, um, we wanted to make it experiences that were connective, that would um, sort of relate the artwork to the public in such a way that um, it wasn't really a passive experience where you just sort of look and don't touch, but exactly the opposite, that it was fundamental to have the complicity of the public and for their participation to be an integral part of the artwork. The other piece that uh, is in the first floor is called Thousand Platitudes and it's a very large photographic triptych. It's made out of photographs taken as part of a public art intervention that I did in Austria um, three years ago. It's basically, I rented the world's brightest projector. It makes images that are 70 meters by 70 meters. They can take over an entire building. And I put it on a 12-ton truck with a diesel generator and we drove around the city making sort of maverick or guerrilla projections onto palaces and prisons and hospitals and shopping malls. And then the result of these interventions we sort of made into a collage um, of words used by cities typically to sell themselves to potential investors, things like modern, cosmopolitan, open, um, you know, stuff like that. And this is this sort of big panels. The third, the fourth piece um, in the second floor we had um, a main work called Pulse Room. Pulse Room is uh, 100 incandescent light bulbs that flash on and off according to the heart rate of the public. There's a tracking system, it's a sensor, not unlike what you might find at an exercise machine at a gym, that detects your heartbeat rate, but it also measures 11 different parameters, electrical parameters of your heart, systolic and diastolic activity, the amplitude of your wave and so on. And then what we do is we render your heartbeat in a light bulb uh, with a very specific signature. So as you participate, the light bulb comes on and off. As you release it, your recording is, stays in the room and it just moves all of the re previous recordings by one position. So at any given time, as you walk into the room and you look up, you see the 100 most recent participants. Um, so it's a project about, about rhythm, it's a, about biorhythm, about um, sort of biometrics, about measuring what it is that is different uh, about us. And it's also something that's quite intimate that then becomes um, it, quite intimate that then becomes a larger tableau, a larger kind of uh, experience. Um, finally, we have a project called Underscan. Underscan is um, also a project from 2006. It's basically 1,000 portraits um, recorded in the cities of Leicester, Nottingham. Derby, Northampton, Lincoln in the UK. Um, and these are reactive portraits. So what happens is that as you walk around and you project your shadow onto the floor, um, somebody appears in your shadow and they look up at you. And um, so long as you stay in, on top of them, they look back and you sort of react to their presence. So it's a very sort of simple project of, uh, of mirroring these video portraits and activating them um, you know, as you walk around the space. So in this project we have uh, 1,000 different portraits that appear inside of your shadow. If you uncover them with your shadow they wake up and if you uh, uh, sort of get away then they go back to sleep. Um, the 1,000 people that were recorded in this project um, were uh, instructed to do only one thing which is to look at the camera at some point. But other than that they were free to do whatever they wanted. So oftentimes they're just saying hello, sometimes they're dancing, sometimes they're doing sign language, uh, they're sending you kisses, they take their clothes off, whatever it is. And if you want them to go away, you just move away from them and they go back to sleep. And then if you don't pay attention to them, they disappear. Um, the, this project originally was designed for public space, so it was presented in very large plazas. And now we're, uh, you know, we've got it in this kind of uh, room where you can go and find, uh, find people. Our image has been captured by a sensor, by a camera, which is upstairs. And um, that camera is basically detecting where people are and it triggers the portraits at the right amount. So what you see in the room next to us is in fact what the camera sees and how it captures presence and what it does 
with uh, with that presence. Most of my work is interactive, and and I often think of my projects as platforms. So um, there really is a theatrical element to these projects, where the public is the actor. Without the public, the piece doesn't exist. For example, if no one's there, the chairs will just sort of um, go down and stay static, or without people, the the frequencies will not be tuned, or there will not be heartbeats up in the in the light bulbs. Um, the idea is that, that people have agency, that they have um, a reading of the work that is in fact an active presence. Marcel Duchamp said, le regard fait le tableau, it is the look that makes the painting. And today I think with interactive art this is really emphasized. In other words, it is only through the complicity of the public that the work itself becomes um, reactive. Um, I believe that um, we are entering a new kind of, uh, of moment in the production and, and presentation of art precisely because we now know that the artworks are listening to the public, the artworks are looking at the public, they're sensing him or her, and they, they react to their presence. And this is, uh, this is something that is actually uh, a little bit of a change. You know, I think that our sort of dogmatic, um, didactic, pedagogical way that we present art is actually very top-down, it's very condescending and paternalistic. With interactive art you give responsibility to the public to, to in fact add to the creation and, uh, and oftentimes this is a very rewarding uh, process. Um, it is, I believe, the responsibility of the artist to disrupt a little bit the environment of surveillance that we live in under Homeland Security and Patriot Act. How can we take these cameras that, for instance, try to detect your ethnic origin, or how can we use these cameras that try and detect your physiognomy and compare it to a database of suspicious individuals, and with something as dark as that, create something that's critical or poetic, or something that will allow it to be a fancy. Um, I've said often that my work sort of departs from one simple hypothesis or, or, or an experiment, which is what would happen if all of these surveillance cameras we have in our cities and in our shopping malls and in our homes, what would happen if these cameras, instead of take image away from us, they projected images, they gave us images. Um, and um, a lot of the work in the Mexican Pavilion is about that, it's about making tangible the observation and, uh, and, and making people relate to that. I think it's a political gesture, not, not in a very direct, moralistic or ethical way, but it's more in a macropolitics of your understanding of your presence and tracking and, and where, what our role with technology is.